Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today to our public seminars. It's very exciting to see that so many of you are really interested in learning more about the immune system. Obviously, it's a topic that's very dear to my heart. So today I'm going to be talking about autoimmunity. And I gather most of you have probably come across this concept. It was only a couple of weeks ago when I was flicking through my social media and I came across this on Huffington Post, the on the rise of autoimmune disease that every woman wants to know. And as you can see, it's got 11,000 Facebook likes, so I understand in social media terms that's, that's doing pretty all right. Um, and the other day when I was walking my dog, I came across an ad for this, immunologist serum. So if you have $163, apparently this uh, helps to protect and enhance skin immune functions and boosts skin immune responses. So this all says to me that there is a bit of a public awareness out there about the immune system and about autoimmunity as well. So when I was asked to give this talk and I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, I polled some of my non-medical friends and the overwhelming majority when, when asked, well, what would you like to know about autoimmunity? Well, about 50% actually asked about allergy, but um, apart from that, the main question really was, well, what actually is autoimmunity? I've heard about it, but I'm not really sure what that means. So what is autoimmunity? If you're after a concise definition or if you've been on the debating circuit, obviously Webster's Dictionary is a great place to start. So autoimmunity is the noun of the adjective autoimmune and it is of relating to or caused by autoantibodies or T cells that attack molecules, cells or tissue of the organism producing them. Well, let me unpack that for you to make that even a little bit easier. And I'm not very high tech, so I was told I could have videos and things, but um, I've opted for, for props. So <laughs> excuse me, this is, this is the best I could do. So as Stuart Tangy said, uh, your immune system is your, your defence system. And we, to protect our bodies, we produce immune cells and these cells then produce proteins such as antibodies. So this is a model of an antibody that someone made for me in the lab and it honestly does look a little bit like this Y. And see these little orange bits here? These bits function to specifically recognise bad things. And when I say bad things, when it pertains to the immune system, obviously we're talking about infections, so bacteria, viruses, and also, as Stuart touched on, sometimes cancers as well. And so what happens in an immune system that's working properly, as you can see, that antibody in my picture there saying, follow me, lads, and that bacteria is looking pretty scared. This is my little bacteria here. The immune system recognises that bacteria, tags it, and can destroy it. But what happens in autoimmunity, oops, sorry. Oops, I don't want to end this. Uh, what happens in autoimmunity is that this antibody malfunctions and starts to recognize self and starts to cause problems. So, in a normal person's immune system, you can think of the immune system as kind of like a homeland defence. So as was previously mentioned, when your immune system's working well, you don't actually really notice what it's doing. As one of the professors here said, it's a bit like your sixth sense. It works out what's bad, deals with it, you don't need to know about it. But the people that I see in my clinics are obviously people who have problems with their immune system. And as, as Stu touched on it, sometimes it's because the immune system is suppressed. So these people we say are immunodeficient, and their main problem is that they have problems controlling infections. But the other group of people that I see have what we now call a dysregulated immune system. So it's not an overactive immune system, which is what a lot of my patients think it is. The problem is that these immune cells are essentially not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So they're not doing their protective soldier function, they're acting like clowns and doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. So in the case of autoimmunity, 
They're attacking your own body. And obviously, in the case of allergy, they're reacting to things that are inherently un unharmful, like pollens that give you hay fever. So in essence, what happens in autoimmunity is that instead of nature's self-defense, you get nature's self-destruction. Now, autoimmunity can affect any system in your body. And I might mention a few disorders that you may have heard about. So if you have autoimmune attack of your brain or your nerves, you can get a disorder called multiple sclerosis. More commonly, perhaps to this audience, you can get an autoimmune inflammation of your thyroid, which is a gland in your neck, which is thyroiditis, and sometimes people call it Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so you might have heard about that. You can also get autoimmune destruction in your lung, where you get a lot of scar tissue formation, and that can really affect the way you breathe. You might feel a bit short of breath. Um, it can affect the heart. It can stop your heart from pumping well. Or it can also stop the signals in your heart um, from functioning the way they're supposed to be, and that you can get what's called arrhythmias. Um, you can get problems with your kidneys, and when that happens, your kidneys are an organ that deals with a lot of chemical waste in your body. So you get a lot of waste buildup, and you need something called dialysis, where you're hooked up to a machine that takes away all the toxins from your body at least three times a week, and you need to sit on that machine for four to six hours. Um, other things are autoimmune myositis or muscle disease. And people with muscle disease can have problems with weakness. Remember, your muscles aren't just in your arms and your legs. They can affect your throat and your swallowing as well and your speech. You can also get uh, the autoimmune arthritis or arthritis, the most common one, of course, being rheumatoid arthritis that we talked about. So you may have heard of lupus. If you like watching TV, like I do, on this great show House, House is always going, oh, it's not lupus. Now, lupus is obviously a good, good disease to talk about on TV because essentially it can affect any organ. So all the organs that I've mentioned so far, if you have lupus, um, you, you can have those manifestations. Now, the really interesting thing about lupus, I guess from a clinical point of view and a scientific point of view, because I do a bit of both, is why is one person's lupus not the same as another person's lupus? So this is an image of a classic lupus rash. It's called the butterfly rash because it occurs over your cheeks. And some people may just have this rash and a bit of arthritis, and that's the only manifestation of their lupus. Whereas other people may have quite devastating kidney disease, like I was talking about, and end up on dialysis. At this stage, we don't really know why one person just gets the skin disease and that's what they get away with, and other people end up with much more organ-threatening diseases. Um, other diseases I talked about is rheumatoid arthritis. So, as I said, it's fairly common. So you may have come across people with hands like this. So rheumatoid arthritis causes a destructive, erosive arthritis that's different to osteoarthritis, which is just from wear and tear. The inflammation, the immune system, actually destroys the joint. Now, we'll go into treatment in a, in a few minutes, but this image is of someone who had rheumatoid arthritis and they didn't get the early treatment, probably because it wasn't available. And as you can see, it results in quite disabling deformities of the hand. And rheumatoid arthritis uh, can be relatively common. Even in some studies, up to one in 100 people can get it. So it's not an uncommon disease. Um, and another disorder you may have heard of is psoriasis, which uh, can present as skin disease. But it can also affect your joints as well. So I'll move on to what causes autoimmunity. And this actually really is the million dollar question. We don't actually know exactly what causes autoimmunity and there's a lot of research going into it, but I'll unpack that for you and just explain what we think is going on. So what we know is it's a combination of things. So one component is your genetics. So we know that if you get the wrong hand of genes, you're more likely to get autoimmune disorders. 
But usually for these common autoimmune disorders, there's no, in most people, there's no one single gene that results in having autoimmune disease. There's got to be something else. So it may be that you need multiple defective, slightly defective genes that on their own don't cause harm. Or what we think is there's something in the environment as well that is causing the autoimmunity on top of this genetic predisposition. So for example, there's um, one disorder which is known as Bichette's disease, which causes um, an immune-mediated ulceration affecting your, your oral cavity, your genitals, and also can cause what we call uveitis, so autoimmune um, destruction of your, eye, your eyes. And this is commonly found in people who were born along the old Silk Route, which is the old trading route between Asia and the Mediterranean. So perhaps there's something genetic there, or perhaps it's something environmental. Another disorder that you may be familiar with is celiac disease. So celiac disease is a gluten intolerance. Now to get celiac disease, often people do have some genes that we can test for, but they also need to be exposed to gluten. So the, the people with the gene, uh, the specific genes that predispose to celiac disease, when those cells see gluten, they start having a reaction and the bowel damage is due to that abnormal reaction to gluten. So if your immune system's working normally, you shouldn't be reacting to gluten. But in these people, they can also then go on to develop autoimmune antibodies, and they can have autoimmune effects of other organs, including the brain and the skin. But clearly, there's an environmental factor there. Uh, as Stu mentioned, there's been some consideration of whether having infections plays a role in autoimmunity. There's been this long-standing theory of molecular mimicry, and by that we mean that maybe some component of the bug is very similar to some component of us. And so when you have an infection and the antibodies recognising the bug, those antibodies that are produced accidentally also start recognising ourselves as well. Um, and then there are other things that can happen, such as in women pregnancy. So this uh, is an image of someone with a thyroid goiter, which can occur in autoimmune thyroiditis. And, and people with this condition can also flare during pregnancy. And this last not very nice picture is a blistering skin disease called paraneoplastic pemphigus, where the body's produced antibodies that are destroying the molecules, the proteins that are holding the cells of the skin together. And this can occur in association with certain cancers. So as you can see, there are many, many factors that can predispose to autoimmunity. But at this stage, in terms of the research, we're still not entirely sure what all those factors are. So how is autoimmunity diagnosed? Well, I think it's really important to stress to everyone here is that it's a combination of the patient's clinical symptoms and the laboratory findings. And often I get referred patients to my clinic who are completely well, but they have an abnormal laboratory finding. And it's really important to understand that in 99.9% .9 of the time, just having that abnormal laboratory finding isn't enough. So to diagnose autoimmune disease, you really need a specialist to really look into your symptoms and then match that with those diagnostic tests. Now, a lot of the tests we can do in the blood, but some tests we can do in the actual organ that's affected. So that pretty green image there is off a kidney of someone with lupus. And you can see all that bright green stuff. That's a dye that is lighting up all the autoantibodies on that person's kidney. So now I'm briefly going to talk about how autoimmunity is treated. And I think really in the last sort of couple of decades, we have come, come on in leaps and bounds in the way that we are treating these disorders. So this first picture, I'm just going to briefly mention about inflammatory bowel disease, again, another common autoimmune disorder. So as you can see in, in the top panel there, that's a very beautiful, normal image of a bowel. And in the bottom panel there is ulcerated bowel. And you can see all that white stuff. That's, that's pus and ulcers. Now... 20 years ago, when I was undergoing medical training, we were still taught that some people with inflammatory bowel disease still needed 
um, their bowel removed. And this can result in having to have a, col a colostomy, so having to have a bag for your waste. And obviously that's not ideal. So luckily with some advances in, in the research and the treatment, this is a, a more of a rare occurrence. So auto, the treatment of autoimmunity, I guess, depends on which organ is affected. Now, if, if one of your endocrine organs are affected, such as your thyroid in thyroiditis or pancreas in, in diabetes, those organs function to produce a hormone, and luckily we can actually replace those hormones. And so that's the way we treat those sorts of disorders. But in general, if you have an organ that has a function that can't be replaced, like your brain or your kidneys, then you need immunosuppression. So what happens with most immunosuppressive therapies is that they're very nonspecific. So not only do they deal with those clown immune cells, they also affect your really good functioning immune cells. And so you can imagine what the problem there would be. You then also become immunodeficient, and that's, a quite, that's quite a significant side effect for a lot of my patients that I see with autoimmunity. So obviously with the deficient immune system, the things that we really need to be vigilant about is the increased susceptibility to infection. So it can be things like the first panel here is an image of shingles, so you can, you're more likely to get shingles if you're on immunosuppression, and you're also more likely to get common infections, relatively common infections such as pneumonia, uh, which is on the left panel, so that's the white fluffy stuff at the bases that's someone with pneumonia. Now things like shingles and pneumonia, we have antivirals and antibiotics to treat, but there are other Severe infections, such as uh, an infection known as the JC virus of the brain, which you actually can't treat, and unfortunately can be fatal. So sometimes, you know, when you're prescribing immunosuppression, you really need to balance the risks of the immunosuppression with what you're trying to achieve in terms of preserving the organ that's been affected by autoimmunity. But luckily, because of current advances in understanding the way autoimmunity works and then following on from that the therapies, we do have now have new targeted therapies that are much better at distinguishing the clowns from the soldiers. And actually, what's really exciting is that some of these therapies, which Tree may touch on, are, are actually modified antibodies themselves. So you might recall the way antibodies work is that they're very good at discriminating things based on these little bits. So they can and should be able to tell the difference between a bug and myself. And what we've done in the, in the research lab now is genetically uh, engineered specific antibodies to then be able to target the cells or the molecules that are causing problems. And so I call this medical sciences counter defense. But obviously, as I mentioned, we're still um, really in the dark about what exactly is causing autoimmunity, particularly with the different disorders, why one person's autoimmune disease is different to someone else's autoimmune disease. And in the advent of all this genetic sequencing that we're now getting much more efficient at, I think we're at a stage where we really need to look at really trying to identify that magic combination of genes and what we call biomarkers, so thing, other things that might have happened that we can detect in blood tests, and hopefully by looking at a combination of those, we'll be able to develop and prescribe specific therapies for people with specific conditions, rather than taking a one-size-fits-all approach, and also hoping to avoid all those nasty complications. Um, so I'll end my talk there, and I think there's a Q&A session um, after our, our next speaker. Thank you.